Hello, everyone. Hello. Cindy Drozda here on this uh, very frosty morning in Colorado. Uh, and I'm here to talk with you about uh, my miniature hollowing tool. Uh, before I get going on that, though, I love to see where everybody's from and see my friends here. So if you if you want to post where you are, good to see you, David, James. Trevor from Canada. I wonder if it's colder in Canada than it is here. It's pretty cold here. Uh, yeah, so great to see all of you. And um, uh, where am I here? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let me get started with things here. Um, I am in Erie, Colorado, USA. And it is right now, it's Last I looked, four degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Our high for the day is supposed to be a balmy four degrees F, which is about minus 14 C or something like that. It's just uh, uh, very, very cold. Um, and I am here, despite the cold, I haven't gone outside yet, doing my biweekly live stream. And so today is... December 22nd. I'll be doing my next one two weeks from now. And uh, my good friend Todd Rains does a similar thing, alternating Fridays, but he won't be doing next Friday. He'll be doing the Friday after. So that's January 13th will be his next one. Um, and here is John from the Netherlands. Really great to see you here. Canada and oh, um, I heard Milwaukee was going to get snow though, so I think you guys are probably ready for it. Texas, cold? Well, I wonder how cold cold really is in Texas, but uh, yeah, it's cold here, all right. And um, yeah, and I am uh, fairly well prepared here with things, so let's get on with some other stuff. I want to tell you about my next online demo. And this is going to be uh, about my Umeki box, lidded Umeki box. Here's the link to sign up. And what I'm going to do is put a link to sign up. And that's uh, that is here. This is my website where you can go sign up for this class online, uh, January 7th, which is a Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 1800 hours GMT or UTC. They're the same this time of year. Uh, if you scan that code, it'll take you right to my website. Uh, and that's the place you can sign up. So, uh, yeah, I will keep that up for a little while as we move on with things. Um, uh, this one here. Oh, you can't see them, can you? Okay, we'll take that away for a second. I am. I do a free sharing and Q&A session about once a month, and the next one is January 20th. That's a Friday, not a Tuesday. I, obviously, I didn't edit this slide properly. It's Friday, January 20th. And to get the Zoom link, you can subscribe to... Uh, I don't know if I have the sign up in. Oh, we'll get rid of that one too. There's my website address. And uh, the sign up thing is actually, uh, is actually. Going to be here. So if you subscribe to my email list, I send out the Zoom link to these sessions. I know I'm, I'm complicated with all these different links to different pages and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how it goes for me. Um, we got a few comments here. Let's see who's joining us today. Ah, Michael, good to see you here. And Mary Alice, great to see you here, wherever you are. There you are. And the 
things that are coming in here. Oh, my friend Todd is here. Todd's the one who does the uh, live streams on Fridays at 2.30 Central Time. Uh, Alameda, good to see you here. Oh, boy, you guys are cold like we are. Maybe windier than we are, too. Uh, and unseasonably cold in Vancouver, even. Yeah, well, it's unseasonably cold here for sure. Absolutely. It, unseasonably. I guess if we're going to have cold, this is the season. But we don't usually get this much cold. So subscribe to my list and you get notifications of all kinds of stuff, uh, including this next thing that's coming up, which is a Meet the Woodturner Live. This is a, an online symposium, online only. And I am not a demonstrator. I'm a vendor at this one. So I'm going to be doing a short demo on the Friday, January 27th. So hope to see you there. Uh, it's a good value. Some good um, up and comings and unique demonstrators. Here are demonstrators you often don't see anywhere else or haven't ever seen before. So it's a little bit of a unique thing there. And uh, I am going to talk today about hollowing my uh my mini with my miniature hollowing tool and so let's uh let's get let's get going with that and um i've got a piece of banksia pod here in the in the chuck. And that's what I'm going to be starting hollowing with. Actually, before I hollow anything, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the other stuff. Like, for instance, we're starting with a Banksia pod. And I, if you've never seen these or heard of them, this is something that's, uh, it's, uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh... It's the fruit of a tree in Australia, and they come in a variety of sizes. The great big ones are as much as maybe 15 inches long and uh, three or so inches in diameter, maybe a little more. And they're very interesting material. And what's, I think, very interesting about them is the fact that you're not cutting any trees down when you use one. So they're, they're just an all... Uh, uh, renewable resource for turners and they're hard like wood. I dry them uh, in my kiln just to be sure because I like to have things dry but the truth is banksia pods are fairly stable in that they don't tend to warp or or change much with the drying. So they're they're a pretty good bet for that. Uh here is what a banksia pod looks like when I get them. They've got the ends where they were attached to the tree and then where the flower was and all that. And uh, what I do first is I cut the ends off and then I take that little center there that looks like a pith and I use that as the center and I put it between centers and turn all the all the rough part of the outside off when I'm making an ornament. And that's what I'm making today. Let's back up a bit here. This is the kind of ornament that I'm going to be making now, or I'm going to show you how I make it. I may not actually finish the whole thing. Uh, it's made from a Banksia pot. I'm going to be hollowing it this way, starting this way. So the top of it is in the chuck at the moment. Back here in the chuck. Um, yeah, and so. I started with it rough and I turned off the outside and then I put CA glue all around it to try to hold the little bits together. And the main thing that has to be held together is these openings sometimes are loose and will fall out. So I reinforced it with CA and I did that last night and I've let it dry and hopefully there won't be any more loose CA in there. Um, yeah, so Michael has got a uh, pretty balmy temperature by our standards, a lot warmer than we are. And I had no idea you didn't get much snow here. You, 
uh, Vancouver, I think is where you are, or somewhere up in the Northwest, um, or the Southwest of Canada. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't get as much snow. Ontario, I bet you get snow there. Oh, and, and in Norway, it's cold. Oh, that's not the one. Good to see you all. And hello from here. Hello, Norway. Cold there, yeah, I bet it is. Uh, they're farther north than all of us. Okay, so Michael is in Victoria, which is uh, the southwest of Canada, north of our northwest. So, uh, yeah. And okay, so where I was is first thing I'm going to shape the ornament. And uh, good question, Jeff. Do I use thin CA? Yes, I use thin CA. And in fact, let me show you the exact one I used this time. I use different brands of CA. I like this glue boost, fill and finish thin. It's a water thin and it soaks in to the pod. I've also used and like the uh, Starbond thin. And I use Parfix also, but that's more of a finishing material than a stabilizing, soaking in type material. Uh, so yeah, I used Thin CA on this here, and I, that's what I'll use on a Banksia pod in general uh, to stabilize them. The medium doesn't soak in as much. And so here's something about Banksia pods. Uh, this isn't really a Banksia pod discussion today, but I can't help it because I'm using one. Um, the, the Banksia pod does not stain from the CA like a lot of wood does. You see it looking darker here, but as soon as I get my bowl gouge, and I'm just going to, um, make sure I've got my tool rest tightly down. I'm just going to clean up the, the surface, true it up, and you'll see that Actually, the Banksia pod doesn't show a stain from the CA like a lot of types of wood do. So I can use CA anywhere and not worry about seeing a, um, a stain, a darker part on the finished piece. So I'm going to start now with the shape of this. And before I do that, let's talk about the gouge I'm using. This is a 40-40 grind of bowl gouge and when i say it's a 40 40 grind regardless of whether it's a u a v or a uh uh parabolic or elliptical the 40 40 grind talks about some uh profile parameters so yeah, okay. Wrangler is here from New Zealand. I guess it's early in the morning out there, and I don't know what that means there, but hopefully it means something nice, <laughs> knowing that guy. Uh, happy holidays to you, Scott, and everyone else, too. And so what I was saying about this um, 4040 is here's what we've got, is we've got a 40-degree bevel angle on the cutting edge. And I measure that with the protractor in the bottom of the flute and against the cutting bevel, I'll get a 40 degree angle. And you know that the cutting bevel on here is just that little bit of a bevel right next to the cutting edge because that's the only part that's getting cut with. The rest of it, I have just removed the heel to get it out of the way with no particular, um, no particular accuracy or precision at all. Oh, okay, so we get a little translation there from Wrangler, and that means morning. It's 8.15 a.m., very good. And that's in uh, Maori, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, so our 40-40, when I say it's 40-40, what I mean is that the other 40 is the sweep angle, and that's the angle created, let me get a little further out here, the angle created on the profile 
There's a 40 degree angle there also between the wing angle and the shaft of the tool. And it's maybe not uh, precise to the tenth of a degree or anything like that. That's just a, a rough guideline about what my 4040 gouge looks like. And here's a, a depiction of it. Um, let's see about that there. It's a 40 degree angle between the bottom of the flute and the cutting bevel, and also a 40 degree angle between the shaft of the tool and the wing sweep. So that's what I mean when I say 40 40. Now, that is not my spindle gouge grind for turning finials, that is a bowl gouge grind. You can do a spindle gouge with that same grind, and it is useful uh, for general spindle work and i've used it that way uh but my finial gouge grind is different and we're not talking about that today because i'm not going to use it but what i'm going to do today now is to start with uh shaping this ornament and and here's paul uh no problem being late uh pre-blizzard yeah i wish i'd thought about pre-blizzard i was driving in the blizzard last night and hello from the Dutch dutchman's uh Wood shack? Yeah, I don't know if you're in Dutchland. I mean, Dutchland, as in the Netherlands, uh, or where you are. So I'm, I'm making my ornament shape, and I'm just going to shape the bottom curve first. Now, even though I put the CA on last night, I smell it. So I'm thinking there's still some potential uncured CA in there. And we'll start the top curve here a little bit, but I'm not going to let the shapes get too thin back here at the headstock side before I do my hollowing. Now for hollowing, I'm going to start with drilling a hole. And I have just decided that I'm going to use a 5 8 diameter hole, about 16 millimeters. So I've got that drill here in the tail stock. And I've slowed the lathe down a lot. It, usually these drills like a really slow lathe speed. And we'll, we'll start the drill in there slowly so that it'll find center pretty well. Uh, question about the CA glue here. Would I, use, would I not use CA accelerator? And uh, the answer is, I did use CA Accelerator last night. So we're talking 12 hours ago, more or less. And then I left it overnight and I still kind of smell it, although I didn't see any CA flying at me. Of course, I don't know if you noticed, but look, look at this picture here, how I was standing when I was turning that. I was off to the side here so that any CA that might have come off was going to go past me, just in case, because you never know with, uh, with CA. Uh, and, and as far as the Banksia, seeds flying out while turning, you know, if you take a look at this one that I have, this is very uh, typical of the pods I get, and the seeds are usually never in there. Um, and if stuff was flying about while I was turning, that's why I wear typically face protection when I'm doing that roughing of the outside, because it's not just seeds, but all the parts fly all over the place, just like when you're turning wood. And so, yeah, wear protection and the seeds, maybe seeds, maybe other bits, but not exactly a problem. Oh, and look at this. Go, this is 
degrees F, undoubtedly, from 48 to minus 7. That was us yesterday. It was 52 F in the morning. And then um, it was, it just like within a half an hour, switched over to about 0 F and falling. And it got down to minus 14, I think, uh, last night. That's F again. And, uh, oh, Illinois is cold. Yeah, I heard that um, Iowa, which is pretty close to you guys, Iowa and Milwaukee were both in for some cold. So you're right between them. You'll probably get it too. Cold, cold this week. Yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm not anticipating actual problems from the seeds or the things flying around because I just, I just deal with it, stuff flying around. Ah, uh, okay, so here's a question, a good question. Uh, will it be available to watch later? And yeah, some of the stuff that I do in these live streams is usually up to watch later, at least for a few days. Sometimes if I don't like the way they came out, <laughs> I'll take them off. Uh, and also if something has dated material in it, like a like a discount, which I have a discount for you all today, and I'm so that I won't leave this up for years so that people will think that uh, they're going to get a discount later. This is only for the next few days. So, um, yeah, I guess wherever you get them, depending on where they're harvested from in Australia, uh, they might have seeds in them. Oh, and here's a good question. Where do I get the pods? And um, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, where are we? Here. Australianburls.com, Jim Syverson. He has some nice pods right now. There are other places to get them. And I'm talking in the U.S. I really don't know where to buy pods in any other country, including the one they come from. But in the U.S., you can get them at uh, Australianburls.com. He has some awesome burls, too. Also, I've seen them at um, Woodcraft, Rockler, Gilmer Woods up in Oregon someplace. And if you go to a symposium, sometimes there's somebody who has them who's there. So yeah, uh, that's a place to get them from Jim. He's a good guy and he has really good quality pods, but they're not the cheapest out there. Generally, the cheapest out there are not the best out there, such as life is. Uh, and I don't have a QR code for him, but if you want to email me, and I'm really easy to find, if you forget some of this stuff, email me and I'll send you a link to wherever. Uh, also, if this is up on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Twitch and all those other things, then, um, and I, on the webinar, then you can uh, stop the recording, you know, and take down the, the website addresses and stuff. But email me and I'll send you links anytime. Okay, so, so what about Visalia, California? Oh, well, 38 is pretty cold for you guys, isn't it? That sounds cold for California. I used to live in Southern California. and never got uh, real cold there. Oh, um, Wood Turner's Catalog. That would be Craft Supplies USA. They carry them. And um, woodturnerscatalog.com, I believe. Um, so, yeah, they have a lot of stuff, too. And um, Exotic Woods in Burlington, Ontario, Canada. Okay, cool. Yeah, and you're right, Paul. Probably lots of other specialty wood supply stores have them. That's what Gilmer is. Uh, and, and they also have a lot of other awesome wood. So if you have a wood supplier, check them. I haven't checked every wood supplier, so I'm only telling you a couple of things that I've heard about, which isn't. Uh, much. Okay. What makes a pod good? That's a great question. Here I wanted to talk about hollowing and y'all are interested in Banksia pods. So we're getting off the track, but you know, that's one of the things about a live stream. That's great is that I can get off the track. And if that's what you want to hear about, that's what we're going to do. So what makes a pod good? Um, when I look at the exterior, I'm looking for these seed hole things to be brown in color and intact. And if they are broken off and grayish looking, and this isn't the greatest example of a 
weathered pod. Oftentimes that means that the pod has been kicked around in the outdoors for a while before it was picked up and sent to the US or UK or wherever. And it might be punky inside. Also, if I were using the exterior as a natural edge, I would want it to look good. Well, in this case, I took one that was very weathered on the outside because I turned away the entire outside. So for something like an ornament or a box or a small holoform, I don't really care how nice the outside looks. What I care about most is if it's going to be punky. And the first thing I'll do when I want to use one is I'll cut the ends off. I'm looking at the end right now. And when you look at the end, you see layers of stuff. And in this layer right here, sometimes you'll see it be whitish or yellowish or streaky looking. And that's often a sign of punky. Sometimes you'll see cracks like this. This one happens to be very uncracked. This is a sort of discoloration you'll see from punkiness, but this one being such a sound looking pot, I'm not suspecting it's punky to the point of a problem. What if it's a little punky? Well, uh, that's not always a problem because the semi-punky ones, as long as they're not so far gone that they're real soft, have more color to them. And I may not want to hollow it because it won't be as strong, but it might make a really great weed pot or, or candle holder or various other things I might want to make out of them. Or maybe a mushroom, uh, a bottle stopper. So the, to answer that question, what makes a pod good? I don't like to say, this is a good one, this is a bad one. I like to say, this one is good for some stuff. And I say this one here, in fact, this actual one, is good for uh, a lot of things, but not probably my first choice for a natural edge. My first choice for natural edge is going to be one more like this one, where you see a lot more intact uh, holes. Actually, that's not even really true. This one is worse. I thought this was a good one, a better one. Well, all right, so I didn't intend to do a Banksyapod quality discussion, so I didn't bring the proper samples over here. But this one actually is, I should have gone the other way. This one's got more weathering on it. See where the outer shell is a little bit scraped away. So this one I would use probably for an ornament because it doesn't have a whole lot of great looking intact natural edge, but it's got nice holes and it's going to look like this one and be just fine. Uh, Sometimes if I'm looking for one that's got, if I want to make a mushroom with a natural edge rim, I just need a rim that's intact. And so I won't, I'll choose, and maybe it's weathered on one end and, and solid on the other, uh, and that'll be uh, what I do with it. Um, things where I'm not going to hollow them, like bottle stoppers and weed pots, just about any pod will do, because I'm not expecting a lot of strength out of it. So, so that's my rundown on uh, pod uh, quality. And yeah, Gilmer Woods is a good place to get them. In fact, Gilmer, if you're into bulk pod buying, they have a deal on a box of 50 where they're like half the prices they would be if you just buy one. Uh, yeah, so that's a good tip. Thank you, Betty. Uh, now, what I was going to do here was I'm getting ready to drill my hole here. And I've got a drill bit of the size I want, which is five eighths of an inch or uh, about 16 millimeters. And I'm starting the drill slowly and seeing if it seems to be making a bunch of noise. It might be, uh, I might be spinning the lathe faster than I want to. And when I can no longer see the chip coming out of the hole, I gripped the chuck. And what I did was grip the chuck on the knurled part, but I didn't want to grip the, the gear part because if I'm holding it and it tries to spin in the Morse taper, then it might hurt me more. This way I'm keeping, uh, and, and we'll do this again. I'm going to make, 
a deeper hole. And when I need to clear the chips, I pull it back out. And I'm holding on to the chuck so that when I pull it back out, it doesn't pull the Morse taper out of the tailstock. And we're going to drill until we get to the tape mark, which I put in there. I put in there to um, for the depth I wanted. And what I actually did there, I don't think I did it right here either, is I've got my tape. I put a mark on the tape. I just went to the end of the tape, and that really wasn't what I wanted to do. So I think I need to drill a little deeper. Yeah, I want to go to where that pencil line on the tape is not to the end of the tape. So now I've got the hole I want and I'm done with the drill. And we've got a question here from Glenn. When I'm turning a Banksia hollow form, how thin of a wall can I make until it might blow up? Well, one never knows about that, do we? Uh, sometimes it'll blow up when it's a quarter of an inch, six millimeters. Sometimes you can get it down to a millimeter and a half, a sixteenth of an inch before it blows up. That will depend on a lot of things. Having the holes stabilized with CA will keep those bits from flying out, which strengthens the whole thing. And so that lessens your chance of a blow up. Having a pod that's more sound rather than punky will lessen your chance of a blow up, but they can still blow up. Uh, ha uh, another question might be, what do I usually do? I have made things where the walls were under an eighth of an inch. Let's say maybe they were two inch, two millimeters thick or even maybe less and they hang together, but I've also had them blow up. So for this today, what am I gonna do? I'm going to aim for, two or three millimeters, an eighth of an inch or slightly under. And what do I prefer for holes, big ones or small ones? I don't really have a hole size preference, but what I do prefer is I wanna see an even disbursement of holes around the whole thing. And oh, there we have some seeds in there and they didn't fly out, they stayed in, but I'm gonna pick them out later. There's another one. Uh, I like to see whether there are lots of holes or fewer holes, I like to see it be even. And that's really just me. Depends what I'm making. But for a hollow form or an ornament, that's what I would uh, shoot for, is um, even disbursement of holes over anything to do with uh, how big or small the holes are. So here we are. Uh, so what I've got here is this is kind of average hole size for a pod like the size I might be using. And you can kind of get an idea here where the holes get, uh, they get smaller as you get closer to the center. So if I was to take a very large pod and turn it down to a small diameter, I'm going to get smaller holes on the exterior than if I took any pod and only turned it down till it barely had its fuzz removed, just turned it down to where the solid material is. Uh, now I'm going to hollow this and I'm, I'm going to hollow it with my uh, miniature hollowing tool. And that was my focus for today was that hollowing tool. Um, and I'd like to talk about that here for a bit. Let's see, I'll just dim this a little more. Okay. And uh, I'm using to hollow my signet hollowing tool. This is a miniature hollowing tool of the same style as the large ones that we would use for uh, hollow, big hollow forms. And 
it is used in much the same way. It's just smaller. It's designed to be able to go through a half inch hole. I'm using a five eighths just to be a little, make it a little easier on myself and to do ornament sized hollow forms. And that means something that is two and a quarter inches or under. That's about 55 millimeters or less. That's kind of the range this tool was designed for if it's going to make a thin walled hollow form of a shape kind of like this one through an opening about like this one. And it's got a carbide cutter on it. Uh, and what they recommend is that every time you go to use the tool, you get the little wrench that comes with it for the, for the carbide. There's a screw there and loosen it up, rotate the cutter just a little bit, and then tighten it back up. And that way the cutter since you're only using one small area at a time, but the entire circumference will cut the moving it a little bit every time gives you a fresh cutting edge. And eventually the carbide cutter will get dull. And so it's good to have a, a spare on hand. Okay, now before I get into anything else, I want to tell you about a discount that I'm offering. I've got a bundle with this tool and a spare cutter. And here is our QR code. You can scan that code and it will take you to a special page on my website where you can get this signet tool and a spare cutter for $5 more. They're usually 20. So you're saving about 10% on the overall thing. And that's good only until Sunday. Um, all right, here is somebody we need to get rid of, and I don't quite know how to do it because uh, you're on another channel. So please pay no attention to people that are trying to sell stuff, and please don't click any links from somebody you don't know that are in the chat, okay? Somebody just um, did that. Okay, some questions about the, first of all, and that's the one I didn't want to see. Click by accident. What about stabilizing Banksia pods? Do they respond well to stabilizing with cactus juice? Um, sort of. So here's what I have found, and I'm not an expert on it, but if I stabilize it with cactus juice, what I found is that the areas around here, the solid areas got a little bit stronger from the cactus juice. But what did not happen was the fuzz didn't get solidified. And if you'll see on this piece of a pod, this is an ornament blank here, all these little gaps around the, the carrier for the holes, do not get filled up with cactus juice. So those two things, the, the fur being stabilized and the holes being the gaps filled in, cactus juice does not do that. But CA does a really great job. So I, I wasn't as happy 100% with the uh, cactus juice stabilizing with the pods as I am with CA stabilizing a pod. Now, there are other things a person might do, such as casting and uh, stuff like that. So have at it if you're into those kinds of things. And I think they would work really well, too. I have filled the holes with oh, CA and brass powder, CA mixed with stone dust, various things like that in the past. Um, now that we have all these different resins to use, I think there's a whole lot of possibility for filling the holes, but I wasn't gonna really talk about that today. So what I wanna talk about today is hollowing with this signet tool. And I'm, I'm going to, well, I wanna show the, the tool here, and then I'm going to show you how I will approach uh, doing the hollowing with this tool. and. 
it it's worth mentioning why is a hollowing tool this shape and the reason is because here's what i'm going to want to do if it's on the tool rest anything that's on the tool rest is supported by the middle of a round bar or the edge of a rectangular bar and any any wood pressure from the wood on that line will be well supported by the tool rest and the tool won't tend to be rolled around and grabby feeling so when i have a tool like this one i need to have my tool rest moved back so that i'm supporting the tool behind the bend like i show here if i support the tool up close to its front then i have my support point on the bend and the cutter is actually overhanging the support point and the mechanical advantage that the tool has there or that the wood has over the tool there and you're holding on to the tool is actually tremendous and that's what makes a hollowing tool grabby you can counteract that in a number of ways the easiest one especially for a small tool like this is just to put your your tool rest behind the bend and then you'll be supporting the cutting edge on the support line and that that uh works so that's what i'm going to start with and uh, I'm going to, I have my tool rest pulled back so that when the tool starts cutting in there, it's supported on the, the width of the steel instead of uh, on the bend. Now, why is there even a bend in here? And that is because in order to get around the corner on a form like this, I need to have a bend in the tool. You'll see people hollow ornaments with a, tool they made out of an Allen wrench where it's just a right angle. And that's going to have the, the cutting edge overhanging the support point by a fair bit. And maybe they're strong enough to just overcome that. Uh, but, and here are a couple of other things. Oh, and we've got a question here uh, from Roy. That's a good question. Can it be honed? Uh, the answer is this type of carbide cutter cannot be honed. It's a cup shaped cutter and it's made of this nanograin carbide that they claim is never going to be sharp again the way it is from the factory if you grind it at all now you could try honing it but it's really not recommended it's not like those flat topped ones where you can hone them on the flat top and they'll get sharper this does not have a flat top can you see that there's kind of the there's a undercut there's a cup shape on the top so it does not have a flat top to hone so it's not recommended to hone it you know of course we do whatever we do all of us so if you want to try it uh, let me know how it comes out i've tried honing these and i haven't had any luck with them they didn't seem to get sharp again okay so two things i'm going to do i'll just move the tool rest back a little further than i need to to for example two things i'm going to do for um making this tool a little more friendly one is i'm going to raise the handle so what i did here is i raise the handle so that the cutting edge is lower than the end of the handle the other thing i'm going to do is i'm going to roll it so that here's the action i did i rolled it so that the cutting edge is lower than the bend also and that gives the tool a very non-aggressive presentation. These cup-shaped carbides can be very aggressive when they touch the wood, and that makes it grabby. So by raising the handle and rolling it over, I get a much more, a much less aggressive presentation. Here's another thing I'm going to do to make this uh, more uh, friendly. And the question about the thickness. Uh, maybe you could type that again. I'm not sure if you mean the thickness of the wood or of the metal in the hollowing tool. It's about a quarter of an inch, six millimeters thick. 
in cross section here, the part that goes into the handle here is whatever size it needs to be to fit into a half inch hole in the handle. So I hope that helps. Oh, and the cutter is a six millimeter diameter. That's about a quarter of an inch diameter cup cutter. And this is made by uh, uh, Mike Hunter. It's his number one uh, cutter. Okay, so I hope that answered your question, John. I'm not sure what word you typed there. That's the way it is with uh, typing. Okay, so so about the the other thing that will help with controlling a tool like this, and you know, this is not just this hollowing tool. The, what I'm talking about here, the um, supporting it behind the bend, and raising the handle, rolling the tool over with handheld hollowing of any kind of other bigger hollowing tool shaped like this, you're going to have the same rules to follow. And the other rule that you can follow on bigger hollowing tools as well is you need some mechanical advantage over the pitching moment of the tool. What I've described so far, the raising the handle above the cutting edge helps the pitching to be uh, less aggressive. The pitching I'm talking about is when the wood pushes down and tries to pitch the handle up because the wood touches the end of the tool and it pushes down and sends the end of the handle up because there's a fulcrum here on uh, the tool rest. So it pushes down, sends the other end up like a teeter-totter. And I'm counteracting that partly by raising the handle. So it's already kind of in a trailing position and I have better control over that pitching moment. But the other thing I want to do is I'm thinking about my handle length. I'm thinking about that I want to have at least five times as much length on the tailstock side of the tool rest, behind the tool rest, my side of the tool rest, however you want to talk about it, to the right of the tool rest, then I have overhanging the tool rest on the workpiece side of it, the headstock side, the front of the tool rest. So if I have a two inch deep ornament that I'm hollowing, I want at least 10 inches of handle. So I don't want a little six inch short handle, even though this looks like a nice friendly small tool. What I have actually is a 12 inch handle on it. So I'm going to get more than that minimum five to one of tool to overhang. And that'll help even more. Okay, so I've got my all of my advantages in order here. And I'm going to start hollowing. Uh, I don't need the tool rest this far back. And... Why wouldn't I just move the tool rest really far back to be absolutely sure I had the cutting edge in line with the support? Well, because something this thin is going to get chattery the farther it overhangs the tool rest. So I don't want it to just overhang the tool rest a lot more than I need to. And I'll keep moving it up as I can. So when I start at the opening, I have the tool rest support on the, the behind the bend. So this is good. So I'm I'm going to start, and I'll start with the lathe kind of slow. Uh, how slow? We're maybe starting with 500 RPM. And we're going to just see how this feels. And if it feels like I could make the speed a little faster, maybe I will. Let's try to make it a little faster. I'm not going to take both hands off the tool while I'm uh working with it so i've got the handle handle up tool rolled over and when i do this i'm discovering that i'd like to have my tool rest a little higher to account for the fact that i have the cutting edge lower than the handle with that um that configuration i've got so i'm just I'm just removing some bulk here, roughly. I'm 
not paying attention to wall thickness at all and just trying to get a bunch of the middle out. And I'm hoping you can hear me over the racket that's being made by the cutting. It's not chattering terribly here, but it does make uh, some noise. So does anyone know where to find those those handle adapters like this that this is a um a, basically a ferrule a collet not exactly collet it's a ferrule with with set screws to hold the tool in but it's the the business end of my tool and there's a there's a part of it that's sleeved inside the wood and glued in and i don't know where to find them in the uk or anywhere but the us so if anybody knows please put it into the comments and we'll all know about it. And if you put it into a comment on your platform, then I will post it for everyone to see. All right, so I'm just um, starting with hollowing roughly here and trying to get a lot of the bulk out. Now here's why I only will ever make ornaments ever again out of banksia pots because I don't need calipers. There's a seed for you. Came out now. There's another one trying to come out. Uh, I don't need calipers because I can see the wall thickness through those holes. I've got a light here that might help you see it better, hopefully. And I don't need to remove the chips because of the holes. So this is this is perfect for small hollow forms, the Banksia pod. And if I were making ornaments to sell and I wanted to be able to go fast, well then I would really want um, something where I didn't have to stop and constantly get the chips out of the holes and use my calipers and all. And I will talk about that um, after a little while. But right now I wanna work on this one and I'm going to start with this area. And I'll get that down to what I want it to be, which is about an eighth of an inch. And when I get close to my desired wall thickness, I'm going to get to where I can actually see the tool inside the piece. And now that I'm hollowing further down, I can, I can, uh, bring my tool rest closer so i'm seeing i've got the wall thickness i want right in this area i can see it through the openings it's still thicker than i want right here so now i'm going to work on on that area a um, little bit more about those those ferrules the i'm assuming you mean ferrule fill this this blue um tool ferrule this is a Thompson brand. One Way makes a very similar thing. I think they're steel instead of aluminum, and I don't know if they're this beautiful blue. Uh, these are available in, this is half inch. They're available in five eighths, half inch, three eighths, and quarter inch for different size tools. One Way makes a variety of them. Michael Hustle sells another type of thing like this. And like Phil is pointing out, Simon Hope has. A lot of stuff in the UK, and if he's a one-way dealer, he's probably got the one-way brand. And there are other places in the UK that that sell uh, general turning supplies, and I would check and see who's got them. They don't always sell them as ferrules to make your own handle. Sometimes they sell them as a tool handle opening reducer. That's what these were made for, but they make perfect uh, handle ferrules for this sort of thing. So uh, my job here now is uh, fairly boring as far as you watching me. I'm just going to keep plugging away at my wall thickness. And the tool is loosening up in the handle, so I get to show you how I put the tool in the handle. This is what the tool looks like. And I've got my round hole in the handle. I'm just going to tighten down. Okay, and that will 
keep it in there. I must have loosened it up earlier. Uh, so yeah, um, the lathe makes a lot of noise doing this. And um, so thanks for the heads up there, Todd. I'll know that I should maybe not talk while I'm doing the hollowing. And I've pretty much done as much hollowing as I need to. That's the wall thickness I want right there. So now to proceed, I would like to have support for my hollowing the whole time. And what I mean by that is I now would like to remove some of the bulk at what will be the top of the ornament, the headstock, the chuck side of things. And I'm not necessarily going to park this off. I might use all the material in the chuck. There's a little bit of damage right here. So I was kind of thinking I left a little extra on this one. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to get my, uh, this is a smaller version of the 4040 bowl gouge I was using earlier. And I'm just going to shape this upper part here. I did not want to do this cut while I was hollowing up near the rim because now it's thinner at the headstock side and I don't have much support for here, for this area. So I've already done the hollowing in here. Now I can go back if I want to and do some more hollowing deeper into the form. And this tool will get from the middle all the way around the shape. That's what it was designed for, was to do small shapes like this. The short bend is, let me get my tool rest out of the way. The short bend, like the distance from the cutter to the end of the bend, is so that it doesn't have to overhang the tool rest as much if you don't need to. And uh, you'll see a lot of these small hollowing tools and they have a longer bend and that means that's the minimum tool rest overhang you're always going to have so this is this is uh quite well designed for small pieces like this so here we've got a question ron um what speed do i turn these at i shape the outside at full speed 3000 rpm I hollow at a speed that feels good. If I'm, if I start slow at, let's say, 800 RPM, and it's just painfully slow going, and I don't feel like it's grabby, I'll turn up the speed a little bit. If I turn up the speed too much, it might start chattering more and uh, make, make it louder and less pleasant. So if that happens, I'll, I'll slow the lathe down. And got a little Banksia pot in my throat there. Okay, uh, and I did not mention the speed. I guess I didn't mention the speed as a number because what I did was I started slow, I turned it up, and it still felt good, so I left it there. But I usually do not hollow something like this with this tool at full RPM on the lathe. So will it fit into a hollowing rig? I, I assume that's what you mean, like a, like a Jameson or a Trent Bosch or a One Way or something. And yes, and does that offer any advantage? Yes, the hollowing rig will offer you taking away your need to deal with either the pitch or the roll moment that the wood puts into the tool because the hollowing rig is stabilizing both of those motions. And the disadvantage to a hollowing rig on a small thing like this is it might feel more cumbersome. You might feel like you can do this faster by hand. I guess that's kind of how I feel about it is uh, instead of getting the big hollowing rig out, I can do something like this pretty easily by hand. So that's what I usually do. Okay, now uh, we're about out of time, but so if you've got a question, uh, bring it on. And once more, I'm going to uh, 
put up here. Oh. I'm going to put up here uh, my, where is it? I don't have it. Okay, I'm just going to put up the QR code for a discount on a bundle that includes the Signet tool with a spare cutter for only $5 more, uh, typically $20. So you get the Signet and the cutter for 130 instead of uh, 100 and is it 50? 125 plus 20, 145. So you're getting the the about 10% off. Okay, I'm not the greatest with math in my head. Uh, if you click that there, you can get to the discount page. You must use that code to get the discount. You can't go to my website and find this page. It's just for you guys. It's just for anyone who's here. It's not something I'm offering everybody. Oh, what happened there now? Okay. A couple of questions here. Um, does the higher turning speed blow it up? Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe not necessarily all on its own. Will it blow it up? What will blow it up is you getting a catch, cutting too aggressively when you get to the thin walls. And that's the thing to do is when you start getting toward the walls being thinner, lessen your cuts. Cut more easily. Don't let it chatter. Make sure you have your mechanical advantage in order. Long enough handle, uh, handle raised a bit so it's higher than the cutting tip, um, tool rest behind the bend, roll the tool over a little bit so that it it so that the cutting edge is also lower than the bend and that would that would uh make it less likely to blow up i i don't know really as though speed directly affects blowing up except that speed can directly affect chatter which can directly affect blowing up so to keep it from chattering at any speed you'll be fine and this this type of hollowing tool yeah you've seen this type of hollowing tool made by other companies Sorby in particular. The difference is this one has a shorter bend. So the distance between the bend and the cutter is shorter. That means your minimum tool rest overhang is less. That means this one is less likely to chatter if you don't need all that tool rest overhang. So that's why it's done this way. And that's what's better about this than perhaps some of the other ones. But yeah, you can find stuff all over the place. Oh, and you can even uh, hollow out a, an ornament that doesn't have a lot of undercut with a scraper like this one. So uh, it's not the only tool that's possible to use out there. This is just a tool that I use, and it is made by Hunter Tools. Um, and you know, you're right, Robert, about one Hunter tool versus another. There are so many that seem so similar. And, and yet they call them different things. They've got some subtle differences, but why would you use one over the other? I do not use all of them enough to know. I tend to be more of a traditional tools person, conventional tools like gouges and stuff. And for hollowing, I tend to use either this tool for little stuff, or if I'm doing anything bigger, I'm using a hollowing rig, the Jameson hollowing rig. So, yeah, I will think about that, though. Um, comparing hunter tools might be a pretty good thing. Uh, okay, so seeing a crack starting on this pod. Uh, oh, right here. Oh, yes. And that is what's called a problem. I, It can happen on pods. CA time. Yep, that's it. CA time. And I kind of made it pretty thin in here and this pod was one that i had had to do a extensive stabilizing with ca and you can kind of see actually how back here you see how it's all torn up lots of tear out when i was cutting right there that's because it's a little bit punky right there so so yeah um that this pod is more likely to have done that than maybe some other pod but no big deal, right? Because a little bit of CA, sand it down, and it's fine. And what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to finish hollowing at the back here and then at the bottom of the piece, or, oh, it's the top, really. And then I'm going to sand it completely. And then I'll reverse chuck it. But one thing I wanted to talk to you about here is that uh, what if I was not uh, using a Banksia pod? How would I deal with it? And here is a piece of, this is ash, uh, just regular, regular wood, no holes. So number one, I'm not going to be able to tell what my wall thickness is without measuring. So Chuck's got one, and, and uh, oh, the bowl part of small scoops. Yeah, that's a good tip, Chuck. And also, yeah, this I'm doing hollow vessel ornament globes with this tool today, but the tool cuts with a little round thing at the very end. And as long as you've got the tool rest back behind the bend, you can actually hollow any number of things. Um, how do I part the piece off? I don't. I put it in a jam chuck. I don't part it off. I turn it around, and I can show you that jam chuck too uh, briefly after I get done with this. Oh, and here's uh, Jeannie Rudinsky. Good to see you. Your your dad Lou is a good friend of mine. Fond memories. Thanks for being here. And here's Rob Wallace. Uh, yes, and if you want to know anything about the botanical end of Banksia pods, I bet you Rob is the guy who will give you more. Uh, uh, incomprehensible verbiage than you ever wanted to know about any plant out there. Uh, right, so here I have a piece of ash that I'm hollowing. And I'm, I've, done, I've done the front part. And I'm, two things I want to show you here. First, I want to show you what I'm going to do about the chips. And the second thing is, what am I going to do about the, uh, the wall thickness? So I've got the same configuration. I've got the handle up, and I've rolled the tool over a bit. And I'm going to turn the lathe on, and, and I'm just going to do a little hollowing in here. And there's my thumb. And then I'm going to show you what I do. There we are. We've got a real thin wall here. What do I do about the chips? Here's what I do. I've got a tool that's a little scooper. And you know, most people will take a tool like this and they'll go stop the lathe and they'll scoop it out. It takes forever. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to turn the lathe off or move the tool rest. I'm just going to put the tool in there and deflect the chips out. And now I can get back to work. So this. I, it's just a homemade thing. It's a piece of quarter inch, six millimeter brass rod, and it's just pounded flat on the end with a hammer. And it, it's just a thing to, as the piece is going around and the chips are up against the wall, the chips come down on this and they get deflected out. So that's what that's all about. That's how I get rid of the chips. If I were, which I don't, as I already said, use wood like this. Um, and then the other thing is, how am I going to measure the wall thickness? And this is a little harder to show on camera, perhaps. Uh, but here's a one kind of a wall thickness caliper. This is a direct read one. It's really easy to see on camera. And this will get in here. But any caliper has got to be measuring through 90 degrees to the wall right here or it won't be accurate. So I'm getting an accurate measurement here, and I'm seeing that I've got about um, 90 thousandths, 330 seconds, or about uh, two millimeters there. And now when I go to try to measure up here, I need to be 90 degrees to the wall. That would mean I have to have my caliper pointing like the pencil is. It's not. It isn't going to give me an accurate reading at all. So I need to find a different kind of caliper. And here's one that I believe I bought from either Packard or Craft Supplies long ago. And this is the one that's got like a, um, it's when it's closed, the tips are touching on both ends. So I actually want to use it this way because I've narrowed down that point a little bit. When it's open, 
on one end, you see it mirrored on the other end. This short bend here will get me 90 degrees to the wall right about uh, here. So that'll be a good measurement. Now it's going to be difficult for me to show you that on camera. We'll try it this way. There you can see it, and it's about two millimeters. So I've got a pretty good consistent wall, and this will measure down to here and down to here. And now the leg is hitting on the opening, and it won't measure any further, but I can reverse it, and now it'll measure here. So this caliper will measure most of this piece. And again, I'll show you what the shape is of this one. It's got a short leg for measuring near the opening and a larger leg for measuring in the large diameter where it's undercut. So that's what I would do if I had to, but I make them out of Banksia pods and I don't even have to pick up a caliper at all. Uh, now, what am I going to do for a reversing? Uh, set up here. Let's take this out. And what I'm going to do is I would make this one a little smaller. I'd get rid of more that I uh, near the chuck if I can, kind of like I did with this one, where I removed a lot of the wood up to the chuck. And then I'll take it out now and I'm going to reverse it into a fixture that will allow me to get to the other side and form what I'm going to form, which is the top of the ornament. See, lots of people will make ornaments and they'll put a through hole in it and they'll make a finial for the top and the bottom. But what I like to do to save time is I make my top finial part of the ornament body. So I'm just gonna make one finial now. And I know it's a different design and different look and everything, but it's also a faster way to make them if you're a person who has a limited time and trying to make a living, you know, as some of us are. And, oh, yes, and here's Lou. Great to see you, Lou. I haven't seen you in a long time since we quit traveling anywhere. Uh, really good. And, Roy, good to have you here. Always, always. Merry Christmas to you and everyone. All right, so question here about the caliper. I believe I got these from Packard Woodworks long ago. Um, Andre Martel makes a really nice caliper, and I think he has a small one available. Oh, Ben. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Vacuum chuck might work for Banksia pod. Yeah, right. No, actually, though, seriously, a vacuum chuck might work for this ash one. And uh, you don't need much vacuum. But here's what I've got for my jam chuck. I've got a jam chuck with a spigot in the middle that fits the opening in my ornament. Oh, hey. Here's what I wanted. Jeff Wyatt, good to see you. He's in Denver, and so you know exactly how cold it is here. Uh, is the small stainless caliper from Johnny Tolly. I don't know what Johnny Tolly offers. He, I would, If I were you and looking for calipers, I would go ask him. I believe Rob is talking about this caliper. Let's get a closer look over here. And um, this is made by... There they are right there, premiergages.com. Um, perhaps Johnny Tolly makes something equally good or better. This is, the reason I use this, you know, I personally, I really don't care much for direct read. I find those double-ended ones really easy to read, but you can't use them on a camera with any, any, any sense because this one, the whole thing is visible on the camera, right? Whereas, this one, I have to 
you can't see the other end. So I have to zoom out and use a different camera and it's a real pain in the neck. So um, I use this because it's good on camera. And that, that other one, there's another kind of caliper I really like. And that's the, what they call the, uh, the figure eight style. And this is great for a lot of shapes, but it's not great for getting right in to measure near the opening. Because just like the C-shaped one, it doesn't get right up close to the hole. Okay, so, so here's my reverse chuck. I've got a spigot that fits the hole, and I've got the bowl part of it hollowed out to kind of conform to the shape of the holoform. So when I put it on, the hole is centering it up, and the bowl is keeping it. Oh, this isn't the one for this one. Uh, this is the one for this one. The bowl is keeping it uh, anchored, stabilized at its large diameter. And I've got it uh, designed so that the bowl of the jam chuck is just slightly smaller than the largest diameter of my vessel. So it's kind of like a Morse taper. It almost jams in there. And you can see this is my test for jam chucks here. If I can turn it with, with it on the jam chuck, if I can turn the spindle by holding the piece in the jam chuck, then it's a tight jam chuck and I'll be comfortable taking the tailstock away. Of course, I'm going to put a piece of tape around it. And while we're talking about it, this gaping big hole here is what happens when one of these hole C hole liners gets popped out. That's what happens when you don't use enough CA at the beginning before you even start. I don't wait for cracks to show up. I CA them all the way. So uh, here's a couple of other things that that premier what's he called premier gauging, right? Premier gauges. Premier gauges. He makes a bunch of stuff. And uh, Rob's got another one of his that's good. And they are very well made. They're made in the USA. And I'm not sure if they're stainless. Rob said stainless, and so he probably knows. Oh, I can find out. How do you know if it's stainless? Get yourself a magnet. Oh, stainless. Absolutely. Very good. So that it is very good quality. Well made and real nice guy. And the plastic calipers. Um, Plastic calipers. I've never seen a plastic wall thickness caliper, but that is a good idea. And if you if plastic calipers work, then all of y'all with the with the three D printers better get to work and make them for all of us. And Rosemary, great to see you here, and uh, Merry Christmas to you too. I hope you make an ornament or two. Uh, I hope all of you all will make ornaments or two. Uh, I think I've, I think I've covered what I wanted to cover today. So um, if you got one more question, get it on in there, and don't forget the discount code here. It's a QR code. This video will stay up until Sunday night, which is the last for the discount. And what it is, it's a bundle of the Signet tool with a spare cutter for about 10% off. And uh, only for you following this code. You can't find it by going to my website. And it's good through Sunday. So, yeah. Uh, watch the video, too, until Sunday if you had to leave early. And then I'm going to take it down because it's not fair for people to see a discount code that doesn't work anymore, right? Uh, Okay, well, oh, and uh, James has got one of those signet tools. Very good, very good. And um, happy holidays to everyone. I don't know if I'm going to eat a lot, but I'll certainly, um, well, I will indulge in my own way, let's just say. So, yeah, great to see you all here. And, um, okay, so Todd's got those tolly calipers. 
Yeah, I need to look into that too. I'd probably love them. I'm a, always a sucker for new tools that work well. Uh, so hopefully I can find out how to buy those. That'll be really good. And we are going to say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Solstice. Today is now a longer day than yesterday was. The sun is returning. Uh, solstice is my favorite uh, wintertime holiday. So, uh, yes. And, and Happy New Year. And don't stop at celebrating just one holiday. Celebrate all of them. Why not? And I will leave you with that. And see y'all next time. Bye-bye.